All right, welcome to Mosaic, and uh, welcome to a time we get to gather together, worship the Lord, spend time together encouraging one another, and uh, yeah, just being here for one another, but yeah, lifting up the name of Jesus. And um, so we're going to stand together and we're going to read the word together and, um, and then pray. So let's all stand while we read Isaiah 55. <clears throat> there we go. All right. So I'll read these, uh, the first verse and you guys together with uh, Angelo will read the second. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it, and it shall, shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Amen. Lord, we thank you, God. Your word is powerful because you are powerful, Lord. You are all powerful, Lord, and you are all wisdom, God. And you, you pour out your wisdom, your power, Lord, your love uh, towards your creation, towards us, God. We thank you, God. We lift you up. You are the Holy One. You are the Almighty. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to have some worship, and then there's going to be a baptism today, and uh, it's going to be a good day. So praise the Lord. I'm so excited to worship the Lord today, especially with all these beautiful brothers and sisters.
Yes, Lord. Amen.
announce that we're going to have a baptism now. Great. So uh, Gabriel prepared a video this week, and uh, he didn't rehearse. Just first, first, first go, recorded it, done. So it's genuine, and uh, it was easier for him to prepare it this way. And so let's turn up the volume on it, and you get to watch that. Hello, everyone. I'm Gabriel. I'm Pastor Cam and Heather's second oldest. And uh, since my dad's passed the church, of course, I've been to church my whole life, I've been to youth group, I've attended church events, but there was no real relationship and no real connection with me and the Lord. And and um, I really got saved then um, in June of 2023. And I remember it distinctly because I think it was that day where uh, it was a youth event at Westview and one of my uh, one of my best friends, Danny, who was leading it, was talking about how you can't live two lives. You can't be serving yourself and God at the same time. And I remember I was thinking, I was thinking, I'm serving myself right now. I'm not, I don't, I, I'm not letting the Lord lead my life. I'm not letting the Lord um, teach me and show me. And I'm not following the Lord. And I remember that night, I was like, I, I gotta get my life to the Lord. This is my only way I can really keep um, living a good life. And the only way, because the shame of sin and stuff like that was just catching up to me. And my life wasn't good. It was, I, I was having a bad life because I couldn't get over these things and I wasn't happy. And I remember that night I just came out to the Lord and the Lord gave me peace. He gave me happiness. He gave me joy. And just right after that, I went to Morningstar Bible Camp, which is a great start to my faith. It was really edifying. It was a really good foundation. And after that, I'd gone through a little bit, a few bumps and jumps, as I call it. And I want to take this next step of my faith. I want to follow the Lord with my life and I want to give him all I have and I want to get baptized. So here I am. Let's get back. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are the Son of God. You came and died for our sin, and you rose again the third day. You ascended to the heavens, and you're there waiting for us, calling us home to you. And we pray for Gabriel, God, that you'd bless his walk with you, bless his life, Lord Jesus. Thank you for his heart. Thank you, God, that he has said yes to you, that he surrendered all, Lord Jesus, that he is yours. And we, God, we, we pray that you would fill his days with, with your spirit's leading, that you would guide him, that you would shepherd him, and that you would be his best friend. Father, we ask that you would encourage his heart in all things and that he would have a life that is free and whole and filled with your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks, techie people, whoever worked that out. That was quick. Awesome. Good job. How great is that? That is so awesome. <laughs> so well awesome. done, Gabriel. What a blessing to be with you all today. Let's stand and worship the Lord for the Lord. Love for 
because it's the Lord's yeah. victory and we can just rest in him. We are in the Lord.
victory. Thank you that we're in you. Thank you, Lord God. We lift you up. We lift your name up. Lord, we praise you. And we're here to worship you and to serve you. Thank you, Lord. Bring us close together as one in you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hey, if we have, if anybody has not uh, experienced or knows the freedom that we were singing about, uh, well, we just if, if, if you don't know about it, maybe talk to Cameron or I or someone here afterwards, but the freedom is for everyone in Christ that we were singing about and the joy in the Lord. And uh, something about, oh, you guys can all be seated if you'd like. <laughs> Sorry. Um, last night was a great celebration of the freedom and the joy in the life uh, that we've all experienced in Christ. It was such a wonderful time. And it really, um, it, was, it was awesome to hear the uh, testimonies of so many people of what God has been doing right from the get-go in their lives. And it made me think of something I just want to share real briefly. Uh, where are we here? A verse just came to mind when I was listening to everybody. And what happened was um, about, maybe it was two years ago, when did we become Mosaic? A year and a half? 20, oh, oh, five years ago. <laughs> Time is flying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, four years ago. Four years ago, Cameron was praying. They, uh, maybe the uh, Heather and them were praying about the name of the church, and it and it came to them that it was going to be Mosaic. And uh, you know, because Mosaic is a bunch of broken pieces of pottery or glass, and it's set together, and it makes this beautiful picture. And uh, he shared about that. I think you know, with us when that was happening, that um, that you know, we're all broken pieces. And God is putting us together in the body, setting us in. But he doesn't just like, it's not just that we're broken pieces. He makes us whole. Uh, he makes us new. We're new creations as well. So anyway, last night was just so cool because I felt like we were getting a chance to like pick up each individual piece of glass or pottery or whatever it was and like kind of just knowing about it a bit more. Like we got to know everyone a little bit better. It was really cool. And then we just set it back down. But it was also seeing how God had set that piece of pottery or that piece of glass, that piece of the mosaic in the body. It was just beautiful. I love it. And it made me think of this verse in, um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 6. And we actually, some of the songs today, we're talking about it a bit as well. Um, and last night, it says, and such were some of you. It went through a whole list of things that we were uh, and that labeled us and that, you know, who we were before Christ. And it says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. We have a new name and we have a new uh, destiny. We have a new um, Father in heaven, everything's new. It's awesome. We're new wineskins. And uh, so there's a new wine being poured into new wineskins, and it's exciting, and it's lovely. And the, just that joy we were just singing and seeing Gabriel get baptized and all that joy, that's just like a hint of eternity because it's just gonna be so amazing. We're gonna have so much joy, so much um, comfort, and so much... Um, yeah, just be with the Lord for eternity. It's gonna be amazing. So I just wanted to share that. And um, I don't, and Connie also wanted to share. Where is she? You wanna come up and share also? <clears throat> Happy to see you, Heather. Good morning. Oh, okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Connie, and uh, I'm getting to know more and more of you. Many I don't know yet. I said uh, to Cameron I wanted to speak about last night, and as Lloyd has shared, it was an amazing night. And we called it Jesus is Victorious. And so it occurred to me as I listened to the brave people sharing their story um, 
at my age, I'm one of the senior folk, <laughs> I've seen a lot of the highs and lows in life, and many of the things they shared I could identify with. Drug addiction, suicide, terminal illness, losses, lots of them. But I grew up in a Christian home. Is that supposed to happen? You betcha. And I'm so thankful for my parents' desire uh, to go to church. We moved into a new area in a little suburb in Toronto, a church up the street, and we went there. And I grew up going to church, going to Sunday school. So when my first husband, at the age of 28, a medical doctor, took his life, that was tough. I knew I was a Christian when I was 13. I really knew who Christ was. I loved him, my hero. And the thing that I want to share today is that he's faithful. And I was so excited to think last night that he saved those guys over there. Those guys who shared about the problems they'd had with drugs. Because that's Satan. He wants our kids. He wants our boys. He wants our daughters. And we live in such a drug culture now. I didn't when I was growing up. But I was very fortunate. I had a wonderful career. I worked in psychiatry. I worked with troubled kids. I saw the early kids uh, after bad trips and what drugs were doing to them in the 60s, the 70s. And it's just, we're marinating it here. And our Lord has given us victory over some of the weirdest, awful experiences. Demonic stuff. Yeah, yeah, a lot of that. So I was really deeply touched and thankful. The Lord never abandons us. And we go through lots. We're targeted. We're the ones, eh? I listened to Tucker Carlson last night. He's not even a Christian. He was... Uh, on stage in Calgary with two of our public intellectuals in Canada, Jordan Peterson and uh, Conrad Black. And here's Tucker Carlson saying, what's Canada doing about the 90 churches that were burned down? Yeah. Christian churches. Wake up. Yeah. So Jesus is victorious. And um, I'll just leave you with, I think, 2 Timothy Paul said, because he was on the way out, you know, he was dying and knew he was going to die. And he said, we don't have a spirit of timidity. We have a spirit of love, power, sound mind. Hey, we're the winners. God bless. Thank you. And I think Lori has an announcement as well. Hello. Um, I've already spoken to a few individuals one-on-one, -on -one, but I wanted to share this with the whole church body because many of you might be interested in this. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Country Gospel Music Association. It started in 1993 in the United States. They always start most of this kind of stuff. But it is now in the past three years entered into Canada. So, but we only have Calgary, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba presently having chapters. I am hoping that I can garnish enough interest in this that we can start a BC chapter. This is not just about music competition. This is about building up people as ministers of the gospel, whether you're participating musically or in spoken. The award categories include music categories, but I want to share also a few of the non-music categories that might pique the interest of some of you here. There's a children's ministry category. We have some great children's ministry leaders here. I hope you'll be interested. There's also a drama category uh, for whistlers and yodelers. 
lyricists, if you do prose, spoken word, there's categories for that, recitations, psalmists, okay, if you want to sing the psalms, literally, from the Bible, there's categories for that, as well as all your typical categories. Yes, they do have awards for this, but it's not so much about the awards. What they do is basically, they also have teaching seminars to help us grow in ministry, help us to be equipped for ministry in all the various different ways, helping us to grow, and also coming together as people in ministry to encourage us, because it's hard work and it gets tiring sometimes, especially if you feel like there's so few of us involved and you, feel, you can feel overwhelmed. This helps to build you back up. You're with another group of people doing the same and feeling the same. So it's a great, great ministry opportunity, great opportunity for growth and encouragement. And I am hoping that we can soon start a BC chapter. Obviously, this is not something I can do on my own. I would love to say I can just start this and woof, off we go. It actually requires a committee of people to be involved. So I am hoping that maybe the Lord might move on some of your hearts to get involved and join with me to start our BC chapter and we can start promoting this level of ministry across BC and amongst all the churches everywhere and participate in our national event, uh, which occurs once a year in the month of June. So uh, there are brochures up here. If anybody's interested, you can take a brochure and uh, um, get more information that way. They also have a website uh, to the US one. The Canadian version is under the auspices of the American location. So all the information you need there, including the links to the Canadian contacts are on the American site. If you have any questions, just see me after the service. I'll do my best. All right, I see to Heather as the greater whistler in the group, so. <laughs> All right, uh, Stephen, you want to come up and pray for the children? Just because whistling came up, I had a movie idea when I was in high school called The Whistler, and you whistle the Star Wars tune as they were fighting, and it was awesome. Um, so I challenged Heather after service one day for a whistle off, if she'd like to. Um, but I just want to thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the kids, Lord. And I pray today, Lord, that you anoint everyone in ministry today, Lord, to hide your words in their heart, Lord. Store them away so they do not sin against you, Lord. And we can pull those powerful words out, Lord. The incorruptible seed when you need them, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If uh, you need a Bible today, please raise your hand and we'd like to pass one out to you. And the kids uh, are dismissed. Uh, my, my lapel mic is on. Yeah, thanks. So, Heather's secret is out. She can, she can whistle with the very best of them. And when I whistle, it sounds like a yodel, so maybe I can win that competition. <laughs> um, Matthew chapter 14. Got mine, Greg. Thank you. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 is, is where we're at today. So we're going to just look at a small section here, verses 13 through 21, and Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is coming off of the heels of uh, the rejection he had faced in his hometown of Nazareth and uh, Herod Antipas beheading John the Baptist. So this is coming right off of that where uh, there's a regathering. The disciples were uh, sent out and they come back and, and this is in uh, a version of this in the other gospels as well this scene that happens here uh, most notably in, in Mark chapter 6 it really parallels with Matthew and Jesus sets out to a deserted place a, a place where there isn't people is the idea of deserted and just to be by himself but the multitudes the many people Hundreds and even thousands of people come rushing there after Jesus. They watched where the boat was going, and they went there on foot. 
So they expended their energy and they get out there and so forth. And I, I ask, what, what do we do when our hearts are weakened by pain and loss and, and yet the needs around us keep presenting themselves to us and uh, we feel quite stretched and so forth and we feel like we don't have much to give. Uh, we need a source of life and strength greater than ourselves. And that's not only when we feel weak and needy. If we're honest, we should be aware that we need a source of life and strength greater than ourselves every moment of every day. And the longer we live, the more aware we should be of that, and often are. When all I have is very little, I also need the Lord to multiply that so that there is something to give. The Lord told Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing. That's, that's a multiplying that the Lord had promised and that he would give to Abraham. Lord, we ask that you would meet us in our needs and that you would multiply your blessings in our lives. Lord, not so that we can live for ourselves or so that we can uh, do something that is any, in any way contrary to what your will is for us, Lord, but that we would live the best life available to you and your Holy Spirit and how you would work in and through us. Lord, show us and reveal that to us. If anyone thinks otherwise, we're fooling ourselves, Lord, that the best life is one that is laid down, is given over to you, it says, here I am, send me. Available, Lord, useful for the master's work. So equip us and strengthen us. And Lord, we, we just want to bring ourselves to you. That's all we can do. That's all we can bring, Lord. And with our will, we, we want to say yes. We ask that you administer through this text and overlook my inadequacy and Bless now in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Matthew chapter 14 and verse 13. When Jesus heard it, when he heard what? He heard about John the Baptist being beheaded. What did he do? He departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. They heard that he had left there and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. So here we see that Jesus is uh, wanting to be out there, taking some time away and, and spend with the Father just in solo or alone with the Father, but he's moved with compassion when he sees these multitudes that are there. And the idea of compassion is, is strong sympathy. It is a very deep word of emotion where his heart is exceedingly stirred. Now, why is he moved with compassion? In Mark's account, in Mark chapter 6, it says that he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And what are sheep without a shepherd like? Sheep without a shepherd are in danger. Sheep without a shepherd are uh, at the peril of the environment around them and their own lack of sense and the uh, predatory creatures that would also be out there. They can be easily taken advantage of and they will not be well fed and they will not be safe. And as a result, sheep without a shepherd are going to be scattered and battered. They are not prize-winning sheep at the fair whatsoever. They're going to be uh, dirty and unhealthy and not at peace. And Jesus sees the multitudes like that. And he sees that they are searching, they are lost, they are hungry, they are spiritually malnourished. And he was moved in compassion, with compassion. God's heart is that people are healthy and people are safe. People are whole. 
His heart is to care for you and me and the multitudes of lost searching souls, vulnerable to the lies and teeth of predators, let alone the environment of the pressure of the evil world run by the prince of the power of the air itself and the, the sin-cursed world as well. God's heart is moved with compassion for hurt people, for lost people, for hungry people, for sick people, for spiritually empty people. But sympathy itself is not enough to save or heal. Sympathy itself must be subject to a greater governing, governing power if it's to be of any use or good. And so when it says he was moved with compassion, he's literally moved with compassion. Not just to the point of feeling. It's not like the familiar hallmark sympathy cards or something like this. I wish you well. You know, I, I see that there's trouble. And, and, and that, that's good to know that people care in the emotion and in the heart. But this is sympathy on a whole another level. In Jesus, it's in the sense of this compassion that is moved by his heart. It's only Jesus, the Son of God, has this level, this, this degree of compassion. And because it, it, it also means there is power to save. And anyone with such a heart where that grows is, is being touched by the heart of God. Jesus, the good shepherd, is moved with compassion that has healing power to save the lost. In verse 15 of Mark 14, it continues and says, When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, and, and in Mark's it says, When the day was now far spent. And it says in Mark that he, was, he had been teaching them many things and healing many. So there's thousands of people, every individual with great needs, and he's healing them. And he is teaching them many things. And the day's now far spent. So if you ever, you know, catch the, I don't know, some, one of the shows where it tries to portray the feeding of the 5,000 and it's uh, noon, it's the wrong time. The director should have put that at evening, right, right before, you know, the, the sundown or something because the text tells us this. Now here it is, it's, it's late in the day. And what do the disciples say, continuing in verse 15? They came to him saying, this is a deserted place. There's no convenience stores. There's no, there's nobody lives out here. It's deserted. And the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. And buy themselves some food, okay? They didn't, people didn't plan for this. This is happening. And uh, they didn't pack and prepare for this this event to occur. They just went out there and uh, they, they, they need something that's greater than, than what it is they could have had at home. And so they go out there, not even understanding fully what it is they're looking for, but they get out there and, and they're getting nourishment and they're getting healing from Jesus. They're, they're like sheep, they're getting bandaged up. And the disciples are thinking very practically, aren't they? They're aware of the physical situation and they request Jesus to send the multitudes away so that they can take care of themselves. And I imagine the people that some of them must have been aware of the physical situation as well. Some of us are, are more keen and aware of circumstantial situations and others are not as much, and that's fine. It's just a character or personality a trait that we some, some have. And they're aware, oh, the gas gauge is low, the time is short, the this is that, and you're practically thinking like Thomas, one of the disciples, was very much like that, I think. And, and some of the people that are out there themselves, they're aware of that, but they traveled there all the way on foot and they see how spirit, I just, Think about how spiritually hungry they must be. Yeah, I'm aware, me and my family are hungry, but this is better. This is better than the food that we need and want, and this is better than getting home on time. And there's this desiring, this need, and they're finding it in Jesus. And the disciples have been spending some time with Jesus and have heard many teachings and, and so forth, and they're saying, okay, um, Let's send these people away now. It's time, it's time to do that. So verse 16, 
the, the dialogue now happens between Jesus and his disciples. But Jesus said to them, to his disciples, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus does not want to send them away. He understands the practicality of everything going on, I guarantee it. But he doesn't send them away. Jesus calls the hungry, the thirsty, the broken to him. And he calls you and me to himself. That in him you would find all that you ever needed. In Isaiah chapter 55, which was uh, from the reading that we had at the start of the service, I want to read a couple of verses to you. In Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. What kind of economy is this? Verse 2, why do you spend money for what is not bread? Send them away that they may go buy themselves something to eat. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to, me, carefully to me. Eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. And then uh, I'll skip down to uh, verse 10 in Isaiah 55. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So God's word is like the, the watering of the earth. And without watering of the earth, do you have any sustenance? The most plentiful plant on earth, uh, grass, feeding the majority of the animals, and the water feeding the, uh, allowing the, the nutrients to come up from the soil into the trees and all the plant life and, and then the animal life and all of this, like the, the necessity of water. But then the necessity of God's word that comes down from heaven and it will not return void. It, it will bring up its crop and its produce. Now, Jesus doesn't send you away when you come to him, does he? No, sorry. Um, oh, yeah, you've had your, your five minutes counseling time. Time's up, you know. Uh, and, and no, he doesn't send us away. He has all the time for you. And he gives the disciples that answer. They do not need to go away. This is where their needs are being met. And I don't want to easily pass up that word you. Give them something to eat. He says... You give them something. He gave his disciples instructions. And we're going to be looking at this scene from the perspective of Jesus, from the disciples and the multitudes. And here in the disciples, they're looking at it and they're going, this is too much. Uh, people need to go to the villages and buy themselves some food and they need to depart. And he says, you give them something to eat. Who? Uh, oh, the, the church leadership has to do oh, Yeah, and that is a job. Absolutely. Um, uh, parents feeding the children and so forth, but they need to become, everyone needs to mature and become responsible where they can provide. And if a man shall not work, he shall not eat. And, and where everybody is doing its share, where the disciples are all being taught. He didn't say, okay, now which one of you 12 is the preacher? You give them something to eat, Peter. No, he said you, the disciples, you give them something to eat eat. And Jesus wanted his disciples to think about how they could serve the people. And whose job did he make it? He made it theirs, yours, mine, the personal responsibility to share the word of God with people, to share the life that God has given you with others. You want us, you want me to give all these people out here in a deserted place, something to eat. This is totally impossible. Well, okay, well, Jesus gave us this instruction, guys. What do we have? What do we have here? 
and, and out has produced a, a little bit. Verse 17 says, and they said to him, we have here only five loaves, two fish. And these are little rolls, basically, a personal barley loaf, probably, a little roll, and then two salted or brined fish, small mackerel-ish fish. Okay, that's enough for one hungry teenager. Uh, what is this? What is this among so many? You know, we here only have five loaves and two fish in the other gospel, it says that, but what is that among so many? In, in the other gospel, it also says, uh, should we go and buy food for everybody? And then they're doing the math. It's maybe 200 denarii, which isn't going to be enough. What's a denarii? That's a day's full wage. Eight months of work for, for one man. Wouldn't be enough to feed this multitude. Even that wouldn't be enough. Everybody would get something, though. So they're looking at their resources available. And they have how much? Very little. They have very little. Next to nothing. And it tells us that there's about 5,000 there and verse 21 at the end of this story, uh, besides men and women. Okay, so if you have a woman for every man and a, uh, you know, let's just add a child there per. So how many people are we looking at? 15,000, we don't know. There are 5,000 men besides women and children. So how much do I have here on a scale of one to five to 15,000? Where am I at? This isn't a scale of one to 10. I am probably at one. That's probably where I am. Okay, all right. I got a lot to give to you, Lord. You can use me for a lot of things with my one out of 15,000 or something. What are these among so many? These five loaves and these two fish. So when we consider our resources how often is like, how can we? But Isaiah had that heart in Isaiah 6. He says, here I am, send me. He didn't say, send me because I have this. Send me because I have that. Moses had nothing. He found out that he was empty after 40 years in the wilderness training. And, and, and we, we, we come to the Lord and we don't say, God, aren't I great? I've got so much to offer you. Lord, boy, is your kingdom blessed now because I am here. And, you know, we come with our brokenness. We come with our emptiness. We come with the, the, the lack, but we come with our needs to Jesus. And he loves us so, and he fills us. And now we're in the right place because being created by God and being separate from God is always an empty place. But being created by God and, and being in him and knowing him and him in your life, that is now right. That is now where we ought to be. And God works in us and through us. And, and we look at our resources and, and often we say, how can I? I? I may have a measure of compassion, but when I look at my resources and, I, and I, compared to the help and the great needs, let's just do the math. My resources, the needs. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And they've already considered this because they already said, send them away. If they were prepared for this, they would have said, okay, is it time for uh, the distribution ministry now? They would have said that. They weren't prepared for this. It's, it's this surprise to them. But sending them away is not what Jesus wants. His compassion is so great. His vi vision is so big. It reaches beyond his thoughts and his feelings. It extends not only into the incarnation and through the Spirit giving us the Word of God. It extends not only through his hands personally, but through him to his disciples, uh, that his heart and power would move in and through their lives Irregardless of how little they were and how little they had, they need now become vessels fit for the master's use. And his compassion is, is so great 
that it not only goes to the disciples then, but it goes through the centuries, through the countries and nations, and to our time in 2024, and to our generation, and to our church, and to our location, and so forth, his church, our fellowship, by his spirit into your heart. Oh, but who am I? That's not the point. We're thinking in, in the, the terms that they are in those cases and the, these ways of our ability to see and understand. But our God is not limited by who, who I, what I have. God is so gr much greater. God's spirit works in your heart and in, through your life today. In verse 18, then it says, he said, Another instruction, the next instruction, after saying they don't need to go away, which is an answer and a response to the first instruction, you give them something to eat. Let me, well, let me check here. The next instruction is bring them here to me. Well, I don't have anything to give, them, to give them. Okay, well, bring them here to me. That's the instruction. What do we bring to Jesus? Not only all that we are, but your family and your neighbors, and you bring them in your prayers, and, and, and you bring people physically if they're willing. You bring people to Jesus, and all I ever have, you know, all I, all I have is very, very, very little. That's all I have. And all I uh, have ever brought to the Lord was my life. Our thought shouldn't be, oh, now you're now it's, this is great because I'm bringing this to you. All my talents, all my resources. God wants your heart. And that's what he works with. And all that other stuff, all your inabilities, all your weaknesses, well, God has a grace that is so sufficient that it can be even counted as a blessing. Because... In your weaknesses, in your inability, you'll be empty of yourself even more. You, you won't be considering yourself. You say, God, if it's not you, then it's nothing. And isn't that the case? All I ever brought was just a beggarly amount compared to the need at hand. And you say, I don't have enough love in my life. Well, you don't. I don't. In and of myself. But Jesus loves me, and this I know. And God pours love into this empty vessel and, and fills you, and you overflow. Where did it come from? It came from the source. That's where it came from. I don't have peace in my life. I don't have joy in my life. I don't have freedom in my life. And then we, we dealt, or whatever the word is, to, we put ourselves in a position saying, oh, I guess I'll never have it. Really? I guess I'll never have it? What if God pours into your life? Does God have it? And can God give it to you? Does he want to? He can, and he does want to, and he does have it. And when you bring your nothing to Jesus, you have everything in him. In his hands, it's a miracle of multiplication. In God's hands, it's an abundance. That's what happens. And Moses shows up before the greatest civilization at the time. And he's a poor speaking shepherd and an old man at 80. And God with Moses and Aaron is greater than that whole army, the greatest army on earth. And others become blessed through it. How can God take nothing and make it something. Not just something. Multiplying it into abundance. He's God. He's always done this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he began with nothing. And he made everything. He is the God of infinite resource. He's not under-resourced. He's not limited in Psalm 78, verse 19 and 20, it says, yes, they spoke against God. And this is when the children of Israel are in the wilderness. They said, can God prepare a table 
a feast in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? And they doubted the Lord. They, 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 they didn't understand how that could happen because they're in the wilderness. And Jesus is about to reveal yet another way how, of who he is to his disciples here in this multiplication of the little that they bring. In verse 19 through 21, then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And Mark adds the green grass springtime, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And filled means filled. To what point were they filled? And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Leftovers, because there was an abundance after this. Anyone else hungry? Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Anyone? No? No one? You know, still? No? Okay. Stop, stop breaking and distributing. Okay, pick up the fragments left. Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. From the father, to the son, to the disciples, to the multitudes. From the father, to the son, to the disciples, to the multitudes. And our God is a great provider. It says that he called them to be seated on the grass. He commanded them to sit down on the green grass. Jesus is the host, and he's hosting people. In Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or I'll want for naught. I'll want for nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It says that he led them into the wilderness for his name's sake, to make a na his name known to the nations. He took a people who were nothing and made them something. He took a people without weapons and destroyed the greatest army on earth. And, and he did all this for his name's sake. And God leads us. He is your guide and he is your shepherd. And in him, you have all the security and peace you could ever need. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. They just had Herod Antipas who beheaded John, and you just had the rejection in Nazareth. And it's not to gloat over your enemies, it, but it's in the presence of the enemies, that though there's enemies all around, you have all the abundance in Christ that you could want. And they can't take it from you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. There's an overflowing blessing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, and that is to pursue you of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is your host. Your guide, your shepherd, your host. And the Lord has this happening in this scene where Jesus is the host in a deserted place. And, and the table of, uh, of food is set and he prepares that table in the wilderness. And Jesus is, is fulfilling this himself. And it's, but it's not just a meager portion. The idea of uh, an, a table or an overflowing cup, it, it was to make ready a feast. You have prepared a table before me. It was, uh, quoting something I read here, it was to detain a guest and set before him the best of everything circumstance could afford. So Jesus is making them stop and sit. 
And they said, send them away. No, give them something to eat. What do you have? Nothing. Bring it to me. Make them sit down. And then in the other gospel also says they sat in ranks, groups of 50s and 100s. So that they could, they could see the math there of how, how much multiplication occurred. But Jesus has people stop and sit. And it's as though he detains them. Have you ever been detained by a gracious host? Not in a negative way, but in the most positive way. Detain. No, come, sit. No, make yourself at home. Let me take your coat. What else do you need? And he is going to provide with the best of his care. Jesus is a gracious host. And David understood that of God, which is why he put those words together there. And Paul understood this, by the way, in Ephesians 3.20. Paul said, God is able to do, he's convinced of it, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, multiplication. In that culture of, of that uh, Middle Eastern culture, the fame of someone was not uh, based on their possessions, okay? The fame that was spread around was based upon the host, the lavish hosting. And, and it was a, gr a great shame if a stranger came to your camp in a Bedouin camp or anything and, and they weren't hosted, and they weren't hosted well. And, and they were treated with protection and dignity and, and all of that. They would take them in, in Jesus' day, wash their feet, help them recline, well, anoint them with oil, anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. I forgot that verse. Give a full cup, and you're never left wanting, is my cup going to be empty? Are there free refills? It's always full. It's always full. And you look, and it's full. You don't have to order another. It's just there and full. And so much blessing. And here it is, the great I am who's come down and is with them, God with us, and he's hosting and he's provided this table for them. And I, I'm sure some of the disciples' eyes get to open. He is the source of all the abundance. 5,000 besides women and children, and they took up fragments in how many baskets? 12 baskets. And how many disciples? 12 disciples. And Jesus cares for even that little. And there's this miracle such that they take some from afterwards, the multiplication. The disciples brought all they had, and they became channels of such a great blessing. When Jesus looked up to heaven and he blessed and broke the bread and, and then distributed it, there's several pictures in there. And the common prayer in the, uh, on the Sabbath and, and at the meals for the Jewish household is, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the world, who gives us uh, bread from the earth. Drink from the vine. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the world. Everything has come from you. Everything is sourced in you. And when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, what did he, what did he teach them to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our food that we need. Your soul needs food. My soul needs food. You can go... Uh, Sometime without eating physical food, will you be hungry? If you go a week without physical food, will you be hungry? Yeah, you'll start finding out what's in your soul. Your soul gets very cranky. You start finding out how hungry your soul is. And what if you don't eat from God's bread? How often are we fasting <laughs> spiritually, as it were? And we need to reverse that. And be so dependent on, on the Lord and the blessings that he has for us, spiritual nourishment. No wonder the world is, is such an absolute mess. It's a beautiful world. It's 
full of evil. People fighting and coveting and lusting and warring. Bloodshed in, in the most beautiful valleys of the world over. There's not a location that there hasn't been bloodshed probably. It's so wicked. And yet there's abundance available if hearts would turn to the Lord. And, and he gave to his disciples. He blessed, he broke, he gave to his disciples. And he gave to them, and now they have a gift to go give. And in the end, after everyone was full, they collect a basket full for each. When we give of ourselves and make yourself available, then sometimes a fear can happen that there's not going to be anything left for you. You're just depleted. If I give from my resource, I will be depleted. But if I become a channel and I give from the Lord's resource and I spend time with the Lord being filled and overflowing, then there's always something there for me. There's always a basket full for me. There's always a blessing there for me. And I can't tell you where... where I spend time reading and praying and studying, and I get so blessed by it. I get so blessed. I, I, I'm not sharing canned sermons. Um, I, I don't go read a bunch of other stuff. I, I, I just get so blessed because I get to spend time and, and get filled, and, and I'm encouraged, and I see things afterwards, and it's, a, it's wonderful. I can stretch myself thin, and everyone can. And we need times to be alone with the Lord and so forth and be aware of, of where your soul is at and have the healthy boundaries or whatever you want to call it. But man, is the Lord your source? Is he my source? Going to him, and he always has that which we need. And he's ready to immediately give it. And not... Not only does this look back to the provision in the wilderness of, of Saudi Arabia and, and the Transjordan, not only does it look back to Psalm 78 and what occurred with the Exodus, and it also looks personally at, as Psalm 23 puts it, so personally that God is your shepherd and your host. But more than that as well, it also looks forward. This whole scene looks forward to the banquet of the king, to the, the promises of the messianic banquet, it's often called. Jesus is also portraying something that's going to come. Or you say, well, he fed them and they got to be at that scene. The disciples were there. Well, I get to be at the one in heaven. I will not drink or eat of this cup until the kingdom of heaven comes, Right? Jesus is looking forward to that. He really is when you read the text. And uh, that, that, you, that you, that I, that all who are in Christ get to sit with him and eat at the table in the coming kingdom. Jesus is the shepherd king. He's the, he's the gracious host, the master of the house. Who, and he will host us at his kingdom banquet. And churches like potlucks, and I hope they do and should, and so forth. And he's, Jesus, this is going to be wonderful. He provides it all. Just, just be in Christ, and you'll be there. And there, there's a picture in that kingship as they sat in ranks in Mark's gospel of 50s and 100s, like an army. They sat in ranks. And they're, they're a spiritual force because they've received the spiritual food and now they can spiritually give to a lost world. In New York, everyone knows there's the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island and it's the god, goddess Columbus or something like this and what's that? Columbia. And um, it says you know, that she holds her lamp for the golden door, this golden door of opportunity. You know? Jesus is the door. What are we talking about? Jesus is the door. And streets made of gold. Well, there's a poem that became famous 
that's written there. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. Wow, that sounds so inviting, so powerful. Everybody coming to this new promised land. But would you be surprised if I tell you that Jesus said it first? Luke chapter 14, Jesus says it. And if you want to turn there, please do, because I'm going to read this section, this parable. It's about the great wedding feast. And it's in Luke 14, starting in verse 15. And if you want to see the one verse where Jesus says it strongly, it's in, it's in verse 21. We'll read that and then go read the whole thing. So the wedding feast um, is happening and the servants go out and we'll read it in a minute. But then it, Jesus says, the master of the house being angry said to a servant, go quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled or the maimed and the lame and the blind. Bring them in. Go out and bring them in. You see how Jesus says it there? Okay, so now I want to read this whole section here from Luke 14, verse 15. When one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. You see that? They're at a table. And who did he dine with? Tax collectors and sinners. Who did he dine with? It's not that he said, yeah, living in your sin. Here's just, here's free food. You know, I'm good company. No, he would speak to them about about that because he wants to free them and liberate them from their sin, absolutely. But Jesus did spend time with and became a friend of sinners, and he's a friend of us. And, And he calls us to the table. And so they're at the table with him, astonished, and someone understands about the messianic uh, banquet. Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is like, that's right. So, verse 16, then he said to him, he gave a parable, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. Is the supper ready? It's ready. Verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. And uh, I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. So I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Every generation. Verse 23, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. There's so much room and so much food. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. They refused it. They refused the gracious host. But there was a seat ready for them. They refused it. And so go out to everyone. That's such an amazing, beautiful picture. And what does that crippled man bring? What What does that poor woman bring? They just come. They come and they celebrate and they bring the Lord glory through receiving of his goodness and and they bless the Lord. It's a beautiful picture. Let's stand. We're going to have communion now. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your host, as your friend, as your savior, then put your faith in him. He's ready to forgive you completely 100% of your sins. You trust that he died and rose again and you can... Have with us this time of communion, which is precious, because it's symbolic of 
the body of Christ and the blood of Christ that was shed and broken for us. That he is the bread of life. And he gave himself for this world to be fed. And that night he took the bread and he broke it and he distributed it. And said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when he did that, there's that picture of multiplication, isn't it? Of one life being distributed so many can have life. He's distributing life freely. We've been invited to his table. So as this song is, uh, we're, we're being led in a song of worship, go to the tables here and let's take the cup and the bread back to our seats and then we'll partake together at his table. There is a field of golden When the 
hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Those 12 disciples became 12 apostles because they were sent out. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us, that you have multiplied your life, Lord, given us life by laying yours down. We thank you for feeding us. Let's partake of the bread with thanks and remembrance of what he's done. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for shedding your blood for us. That you did this once for all for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you that we are free and that we are bought with the costly and precious price of the Lamb's blood. We thank you, Jesus, that he who the Son sets free is free indeed and that there is no record against us in the courts of heaven but we are in the sun. And we thank you, Jesus, that there's a table for us and a place for us reserved. We thank you, Lord, no one can take our place. God, we pray that you would help us to live and thrive in the new covenant, that you love us, that you're for us, and that you're with us until your kingdom comes, Lord. Let's partake of the cup with thanks and remembrance. And Lord, we look forward to that day when we get to be with you and we get to sit at your table and we get to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we get to be at the banquet and the feast with all of the saints through all the ages. Maranatha. Let's worship. Or, sorry, one, Christian, come on up and then we'll continue worship. Hi, so uh, I have a couple friends that I've been friends with for 20 years before my Christian walk. They're both not Christians and I try to share the gospel with them every time and again, but they don't want to hear it. But they're good people and, well, you know what I mean, but <laughs> they're nice. Um, and um, I, they've been trying to have a kid for like seven, eight years now and it's been unsuccessful. And for the last couple years, I felt like I just wanted to go pray over them, but I just felt like I wasn't, I, there was gonna be a timing and the Lord would tell me and I just, so I just never did it for a few years and, and, uh, and then we ended up having a kid and, and then on just the other night, I had a dream and I dreamt about them having twins and I've never had them even in my dreams, so that was pretty powerful. And when I woke up, um, I was opened up my phone, and on my Facebook feed, it was a picture of them right away, like a, like a memory. And then and then I scrolled down a bit, and it was a post by them, and I was like, wow, this is like I, this. I've, God knows how to speak to certain people, and He knows that that's what I needed. And I was like, I got it. I have to go and pray over them. And so um, I went first. I one of them is like really hard-hearted, doesn't want to hear the gospel at all, won't, like I tried to ask for, to pray for them before and she refused and, and uh, so I asked for God to soften their hearts and then I went and, and asked if I could pray for them and said this is serious and I said if you guys just accept this, that it will happen, but it, I can't, it won't happen if you guys don't accept it, so I have to ask and they, they, and they opened up their hearts and, 
And they said, yeah, um, how do we do this? And I said, I'm just going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And I prayed for them. And, and, uh, and then after prayer, she was in tears. And, and she's a pretty tough woman. I've never seen her really in tears in my life, actually. And, uh, and when we were, I was going out the door, she said, and we were just kind of chit-chatting back and forth, she said to me, um, well, if this works, then I'll start believing. And so <laughs> I just, I'm just hoping to get a lot of prayer for this because if this works and if this is the way that it gets them into the kingdom, then <laughs> that will be something. So I just wanted to ask for prayer. Maybe, maybe I'll lead the prayer. Dear Lord Father, we just thank you for everything that you give. And the timing can be even more right as this sermon about being multiplied, Lord. We just ask that you multiply their lives, Lord. Bring fruit into their lives, Lord. The timing of everything is just lining up so well. And, and I was nervous to come up here, but after that sermon, I just felt like I, I got, you were calling me to come up here. And, and so, Lord, we just ask you that you just extend your miraculous hand onto them, Lord, and bring healing into their house and let them know the power of you, O oh Lord, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. And congratulations for having the yeah. baby. <laughs> Amen. Let's just, let, yeah, let's just take a moment of of waiting on the Lord and that um, you would know and hear him that all you are is sustained by him. Amen. That he meets all of your needs and supplies all that you need. the things of your heart, the physical necessities. having communion with one another with you, Lord. We just know that you've provided all things and you didn't spare your own son. How shall you not also freely give us all things that are needed for life and godliness? So we thank you for being gracious and providing for us. We thank you, Lord, that all the blessings that we have and it all belongs to you.
never stop working You never stop, you never stop working And even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you working even when i don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is
Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that you are blessed. And as you are blessed, you become a blessing. And that God's grace is multiplied to you, in you, through you. And that you have all that you need in him. All the riches and glory in Christ Jesus are yours uh, in Christ. So I pray that you just know that the Lord is your shepherd. He's your friend. He's your host. He's your guide. He's with you. So who can be against you? Amen. And we certainly have overcome in him. So, Lord, we give you praise. We give you thanks. Bless your body. Bless your people. Bless us now, Lord. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Thank you that there's no lack of resource in you. We trust you with everything, Lord. And where we're struggling to trust, we give that to you. Thank you, God. We bless your name. You're good. You're gracious. You're kind. You're our shepherd king, and you're coming back. Maranatha. Maranatha. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Be encouraged.